I uh, want to welcome you on behalf of myself, of course, uh, coordinator for the Alder Group in the Committee of Industry and Energy, but also on behalf on, of Chris Davis, who is the coordinator in uh, the Committee of Environment. And we jointly do this uh, because we are in a very crucial moment for Europe right now, for the climate right now, for European competitiveness right now, and of course for the European power sector who is key to a lot of uh, the solutions that we are trying to find in the uh, European policy making in, in uh, the European Union. And of course, as you know, the Parliament is uh, with the Lisbon Treaty. We are more, even more into these issues than we were before. Now, uh, of course, we know the crucial situation when it comes to our fulfilling our targets uh, on climate change. But there is also uh, severe problems when it comes to competitiveness because of the, not only because of the financial crisis, but also because of the situation the European industry is in. And that is also because of the situation that the European power sector is in. Uh, we could talk about the grid, we could talk about the power generation, we could talk about the need for future energy, we could talk about demography and a lot of things. But in this, the power sector is in the middle of all these discussions. And the emission trading system is one of the tools that we have created uh, to, as part of the solution. Now, um, ETS is currently not driving decarbonisation of the power generation sector. There is a discussion on prices. There is a discussion on the next period of, of the emission trading uh, system. There is also discussion on, on the investment horizons. And what we really need would be uh, to set ETS targets to 2030 and beyond. We would really need clear signals when it comes to energy efficiency binding targets to 2020, 2030, and 2050, and the same for renewables. Because if we, haven't, if we don't have this in place, we can already see that the results or the improvements that we wanted are, are slacking. It, the curves are not up to the targets that we have decided, with a huge majority, actually, in, in the parliament and also in the, in the council. Uh, how are we going to solve the upfront financing, the set aside, and where can we find new and additional money, and how could we balance to get a working market, a working internal market for the energy, but also a working market for the emission trading system? It's been, still I'm an optimist, uh, the ETS has been dead and buried, buried uh, a number of times. At first, people said it would never work. And then the prices were too low, it will never work. And then the prices were too high, it will never work. And now we are in a fairly good level. But with the situation we've got in, and especially now with the German decision from yesterday, there are a lot of new challenges. And that's why we arranged this seminar today. And I'm so happy to have a a speaker's list that is, I think, the best you can get in Brussels right now on the topic. Joost Elbeck, of course, Director General for Climate Action, and a, on all the, the worst dossiers <laughs> I've seen for seven years, he's been in <laughs> contributing to, to solutions, like REACH, like, well, a number of things. Jan Showcroft, your electric, of course, from the industry, knows what should be done. Giles Dixon from, the, uh, uh, from Alstom, who is also part of the industry, of course, and, and, and from a company that could provide the solutions as well. And Sanjeev, who has worked as an expert on this for E3G for, for many years, and is always, is not afraid of saying the truth, and I think that's good. <laughs> Uh, because in, in a challenging time like this, we need to see where the realities are to, to bring the solutions forward. So, Jos, 
I will ask you to start, and uh, I know you will make a, a broad outline of the problem, and I hope you end with some proposals for solutions. <laughs> Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lena, for your nice introduction, and indeed, we have been uh, discussing on a number of dossiers, not uh, least to reach and uh, CO2 in cars and uh, ETS and whatever. Always has been a pleasure to work this out. Now, on ETS, I think uh, the challenge is decarbonisation of the European power sector. Um, and I think that um, uh, what we have already in place, it's good to remind us on what we have uh, today in terms of targets for 2020. And uh, that is quite exceptional in the world that we already have targets for 2020, I have to say. That is that we have a legal commitment already to reduce emissions by 20%. You know that. We have a legal um, uh, commitment to increase the share of renewables in the energy mix to 20% by 2020. Um, I think we are on those two relatively well on track, uh, more so on the greenhouse gas emissions than on the renewables. There are here and there member states uh, facing up to some problems, but I think that uh, uh, the wake-up call has been sent. We also have a third target on the uh, improvement of the energy efficiency by 20% compared to business as usual. And there we are not at all on track. In fact, uh, we would have done, according to the latest uh, calculations, only half of that. We would be at 10% instead of 20%. So I think that current policies, uh, we can conclude, are not sufficient to achieve the long-term target that heads of state have endorsed already. And that long-term target is uh, 80 to 95% greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2050. So we have some work to do. And that is exactly what we did. Um, and uh, the, the, the thing we are hammering on is on the energy efficiency uh, plan. Now, the heads of state in uh, 2011, February 2011, endorsed that um, energy savings and energy efficiency is uh, very important for buildings, transport, products, and processes. And so the European Commission adopted a uh, energy efficiency plan with additional measures in order to reach that 20% target by 2020. And currently, we are preparing an energy efficiency directive. So um, the, the, the work is on. Uh, now, what we have done in, uh, in the DG Clima, uh, together with uh, lots of colleagues from DG uh, Energy, DG Move uh, on Transport, Industry, um, Economic and Financial Affairs, is to work out a roadmap for 2050. Um, and we try to do that in a cost-effective manner, sketching out an emission reduction part between today and 2050 to fill out the task that heads of state have already endorsed. So um, it's a bit of a heroic uh, exercise because uh, an economic forecasting exercise for 40 years ahead is not an easy thing to do. But it is very important to see how coherent policy packages could be formed and could deliver or could not deliver in a cost-effective way the reductions we need. So we were sketching out the key technologies. We were sketching out the investments we need, the opportunities we have in all this. Um, it guides EU national regional policies, we hope. And we hope as well that this gives a useful direction to the private sector and to private households because it gives the long-term perspective beyond the legal uh, objective of uh, 2020. So let me uh, uh, spend a few more words on this uh, roadmap. And um, uh, again, what I said uh, earlier is that this energy efficiency target of 20% is on our table, and on, that is the target on which we are delivering uh, the worst. So the, the, the question that is in front of us, how can we create clarity for long-term investments? And as we are talking uh, on the power sector, the power sector is covered by the ETS. How are we going to create that clarity, incorporating, of course, the reality of the existence of the ETS? So we will have to define a framework beyond 2020. Uh, that is the, the, the milestone that we were setting ourselves for 2030. There is related to that the question on what we have already agreed in the legislation, that is the 174% linear reduction uh, of greenhouse gas emissions 
whether that is going to be sufficient, whether that should not be reviewed, and, of course, the measures to protect vulnerable industries against carbon leakage, on which I will come back in a minute. So um, the cost-efficient pathway that we summarized in the graph you see in front of you, I think is um, very important um, because it sketches out differentiated patterns according to different sectors. And uh, as we are almost entirely decarbonizing, coffee please, decarbonizing for the power sector, we uh, estimate that a full decarbonization of, for example, the transport sector is going to be more challenging. So we differentiated the targets and we said perhaps we have to go for 100% decarbonization for power, while we can perhaps afford uh, a decarbonization up to 60% for transport. Uh, why is that? Because transport is the biggest challenge today. I think more than 99% of uh, fossil fuels are uh, being consumed in the transport sector. And although we foresee the electrification of the transport sector, and in particular a uh, very important role for hybrid and electric cars, uh, I think that uh, going beyond 60% uh, may be challenging. So what we were sketching out in terms of an efficient and read with that a cost-efficient pathway, that is that for 2030, we would have to do a reduction of minus 40%, and for 2040, minus 60%. Um, brings the question, what should we do for 2020? And uh, a cost-efficient uh, pathway should bring us to 25% domestic reductions in 2020. You know, we had last year a paper uh, saying we should have a target in Europe of minus 30% perhaps for 2020. Well, in fact, that target is composed of a domestic reduction of 25% and 5% uh, international credits such as CDM. So we are completely coherent uh, with that uh, story. Now let's have a look at the power sector, uh, the technologies and the investments um, we may need, as I said, almost carbon-free by 2050. We will need all technologies. We will need, of course, renewable energy. We will need also fossil fuels. But we hope by then that the CCS, the carbon capture and storage technology, will not only be available, but will also be mandatorily applied in the EU as of 2025. Uh, also, nuclear is having its place um, we uh, finalized our roadmap uh, just a couple of days before the accident in Fukushima. Uh, so the role of nuclear uh, may, uh, may be the subject of some more discussion. As we heard yesterday in Germany, uh, Commissioner Oettinger is preparing an energy roadmap for the end of the year. I think that's going to be a major issue. Uh, but um, I would like to underline that the roadmap estimates that you see in front of you incorporate already the reality of Germany, because in fact, uh, that is what was officially, legally already adopted. That is a phase out in the not too distant future of the oldest installations. And over the long term, 2050, a completely nuclear free uh, German uh, power production. That there were political discussions how to change that. Now, these have now been removed, but I just would like to underline that the roadmap we did uh, is completely in line with um, the uh, recent decisions made by Germany, which are obviously very important uh, for uh, the future of some technologies, in particular uh, the renewables versus the nuclear um, uh, um, uh, switch is going to be a very important. We think that the EU ETS is and will increasingly be a key driver, because there is one change that is not yet completely encapsulated in lots of discussions I'm participating in, that is that for the power sector, as of the 1st of January 2013, we will have full auctioning. So auctioning is more than half of the, of the uh, uh, ETS, uh, which is uh, quite an important change, which is a tenfold increase compared to what we have today. Today we are approximately around 4 or 5 percent of auctioning of the allowances handed out for free to the, to the covered industries. As of the 1st of January of 2013, this will be more than 50 percent. And that change uh, is already understood by the long-term 
uh, analysts of the power sector, but is not yet fully grasped in all its detail, I think, by uh, those involved in this. Of course, we will need a lot of investment in the power sector, and in particular in the renovation of the grids, because we know that renewable energy uh, is very irregular in production. When the wind blows, there is a lot of uh, uh, w wind electricity. But when this not is blowing, then uh, uh, that lack of electricity has to be covered up by something else. And that has a quite a challenging, that creates quite a challenging situation to the grid. And that is where we are uh, seeing that the smart grids, as they are called, are going to be very important for uh, covering this uh, shortage, uh, shortages, uh, respectively surpluses, of, um, of irregular um, uh, power production by renewables. Um, there is the question if the carbon capture and storage technology would be delayed. Um, is the roadmap still feasible? We think it is. But of course, it would be at higher costs. And I think that's a very important element because I stressed that the roadmap has been done with the assumption of cost effectiveness mm -hmm. as, the, as the point of departure. Uh, how can we bring about the 80-95% at a cost in a cost effective manner? And so uh, we did this variation on CCS. Uh, now, on CCS, we are quite upbeat. We are uh, constituting a, a fund, the new entrance reserve that is, according to market prices, almost 5 billion euros, which is quite an important one. And I have to praise this house that has been extremely helpful in uh, bringing uh, forward this kind of uh, uh, reserve. Not an easy thing. It was not an easy thing. I fully remember that. But they have 300 million allowances, which is 5 billion. I think when we look at what is happening in the RTD uh, sector, it's quite exceptional to have such a huge fund available for demonstration plans, not just for research and development, for, uh, but for demonstration, which I think is, for this current technology, the key thing. So uh, I think that, that is the, the summary of the power sector. Now let's have a word on the ETS. Um, uh, th there is a lot to do about uh, the role of the prices and the carbon market, etc. And it is a little bit of a wake-up call that uh, I would like to make to all those who are covered by the instrument. We have that instrument. It has been designed in an approach to have a cost-effective reduction of the carbon emissions, as I was outlining. We have that instrument. It has currently a business volume every year of around 100 billion euros. Some 11,000 installations are covered. The market price today is around 17 uh, euros. And uh, we think that if we would not have the EDS, the picture for the sector would look entirely different. Of course, the reality can always be better. It can also be worse. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about the price signal. Should we not have higher prices or lower prices? Uh, we have seen higher prices, and we have observed that higher prices, of course, push the system towards low carbon, lower carbon emissions. Um, having said that, uh, we avoided a debate about an optimal price, because it's not the role of the regulator to put forward the price. And uh, also, uh, when we would go into that debate, what is high for some will be very low for someone else and vice versa. So I think the best thing we can do is concentrate ourselves on the, on the ceiling, on the, on the capping of the emissions, and, and that is um, what the story is all about. I also would like to remind us of uh, 2013 that we have the system widened up with new sectors, aviation coming in. It's going to be a very important change. You, you see how nervous the airline companies around the world are because incoming and uh, departing flights, outgoing flights would be covered as of the 1st of January 2012. And aviation is a very important sector. It's about 3% of worldwide emissions and rapidly growing. Uh, so there is more political work to do on that. Legally, the work is done. But I think politically, we face some challenges uh, not least from China and from the United States. And I think speaking out on that is going to be very uh, important. Uh, there has been a number of questions on whether we are ready already now with the new ETS. Um, because full auctioning means that we will, have, we will need a full infrastructure in place. I think uh, it's fair to say that we have gone three quarters of the way. Uh, that is that all basic regulations are in place. We still have to, and we are uh, hard working on having the auctioning platform decided. 
uh, because we could only do that after the adoption of the legislation, but that's well on track. Uh, a reminder is that at the adoption of the carbon and energy package, states, member states did not want to have a legal decision on the earmarking of the revenue, but they made a very important political commitment that half of the revenue raised through auctioning would be spent in carbon related slash energy efficient equipment and investments. Can, can I ask you on this, as it was my amendment actually, <laughs> <laughs> how do you guarantee and the full transparency of the use of this money? Yeah. Um, guaranteeing is a strong word, but we can have as much peer pressure as possible because it is a political commitment, it's not a legal commitment. And we are making a proposal in two months from now, in September, around uh, or on the review of the monitoring mechanism on greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the provisions is going to be that every single member state has to report about the use of the auctioning revenues um, in order to increase transparency. Because today, it's true, there is no reporting mechanism and that reporting would have to happen every year. So that's going to be a very important uh, uh, article of the monitoring mechanism and I really would hope that we can count on the full support of, uh, of this House uh, because it's, it's going to be you know, not an easy one to pass. Uh, but we are strongly committed that as this money is being raised in significant amounts for a specific purpose, that there should be a maximum of clarity and commitment about how it is spent. So uh, we take it up in our monitoring uh, mechanism. Uh, we, we wanted to, to have it legally binding, uh, but you know that uh, earmarking of revenues is uh, uh, a holy cow in some uh, of the member states, and uh, that's the way it was uh, going. You also know that we had a registry security problem. We were the subject of an attack of, um, of cyber criminals. Um, we um, uh, could uh, uh, address that problem. Uh, fingers crossed that problem is addressed now. We locked out all 27 registries of the member states until a proof was made that the system was security uh, free or was uh, having a maximum of security. And gradually we were reconnecting the member states. And since a couple of uh, weeks, uh, we have all member states reconnected uh, again. Now there is a new registry coming, a community-wide registry, and that is going to have the highest safeguards, and that is going to start as of uh, next year. Um, a, a very important reminder is, is on international competition, in particular for sectors outside the power sector, because the power sector is basically a European sector. I think that 99% or more of the production of electricity is consumed inside the EU, which is not the case for sectors like steel or, or, or cement or chemicals um, or aluminum, etc. So we had a system of free allocation, a partial or full, compared to a benchmark. And these benchmarks have now been adopted, have been put in law. Uh, the, we are now rolling them out in terms uh, of the uh, allocation plans as of 2013. But whatever we decide on a set-aside system or whatever we decide on the change of the linear factor, this would not change. This would not change the decisions on the benchmarks uh, because the benchmarks have just been done. Uh, we have gone through uh, a very good cooperation with industry. In the end, it was a very delicate and difficult decision, and we have no intention to open that up again. And I would like to uh, make clear that the linear uh, factor or the set aside uh, would have its major impact on the power sector, uh, but not on the system of benchmarks uh, that we um, adopted. Um, a final word on the enhanced market oversight. Uh, because as this market now is uh, having a significant business volume, 100 billion euros a year, there have been a lot of questions, do we have sufficient market oversight? This comes close to a financial market. Um, so we uh, should have the implementation of the MIFID and the MAT directives as on financial products, which is already the case today for all activities related to the futures market. 
but the spot market is not uh, covered. And uh, we are now considering what is the best way. And you know that the Commission in a couple of months is going to uh, propose a reform of the financial sector. And uh, we are currently investigating whether we should not be part of that major exercise. Uh, because I have to say that when we were the subject of the cyber attacks, uh, that the financial authorities in the member states uh, have been extremely helpful in tracing uh, uh, the criminals, uh, in initiating action and stopping uh, the fraud. And I think that cooperating further on this now that this awareness has been raised could, could be a useful uh, way forward. Um, so just to summarize, what are then the milestones for uh, uh, 2030 and 2050. Overall, we would like to see for 2030 a 40% reduction, at least uh, based on 1990, and a 35 to 40% based on 2005, which means that under the ETS sectors, we would have to do more than under the non-ETS sectors, uh, in particular related to the comment I made on transport, but also on a number of uh, uh, realities like in the construction and, and buildings, uh, where tapping the emission reduction potential seemingly is more difficult, more slow, and more costly compared to the ETS sectors. ETS sectors are the subject of rapid technological change, and investments could uh, be related to that. A final slide is on the carbon prices. I was making already a few <coughs> comments on the carbon price. Um, in fact, what you see on different scenarios is uh, that if we have a high oil price, we see a kind of depressing effect on the, on the carbon price. There, is a, a, there seems to be a, a, a relationship between the two, which is also something that the IEA was highlighting very much. Um, what we also see is that the prices are going to be higher uh, in case we have delayed action on climate change. So uh, the real challenge is to have the curves as flat as possible, and, um, and, and that is clearly what we see possible. Uh, you have the, the pink line, which is the line in case we have global efforts, in case we have a global agreement, uh, also from the emerging economies, really bringing about emission reductions. And you may ask yourself, why is that pink line showing rapidly increasing costs uh, re, uh, compared to the orange line, uh, which we think as the, uh, is the reference case? That is, if the whole world moves together in carbon reductions, the cheap reductions are being done in the countries and the foreign countries themselves instead of having the cheap options uh, and the cheap credits available to us through CDM. So you get in, in a kind of uh, strange situation that if Europe is going to go alone on carbon markets and if we have a free import of credits, then it is relatively cheap to go this way, but you don't reach the effect. You only reach the effect in terms of of mastering climate change uh, in case the whole world is moving together. If the whole world is moving together, then there is no uh, uh, reason to be worried about com uh, competitiveness effects. And so uh, the pink line seems to be, uh, to us, the optimal line. That means that in the uh, long term, we will see uh, higher uh, carbon prices in case the, the world moves uh, together, and that's clearly our platform. We are preparing for Durban. We are having as the headline in our uh, negotiation platform that we need a single legally binding agreement in which all major economies are covered, including the United States, including uh, China, including India, the emerging economies. Uh, we know that's not for tomorrow, but we should continue hammer on that nail uh, because that's the only way of mastering and bringing about 80 to 95 percent or uh, reduce our emissions by half as heads of state at the level of the G13 have already agreed about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, giving this broad overview and still being able to touch on the difficult problems uh, in such a clear way is really uh, remarkable. <laughs> And uh, as an audience, you have to be very awake early in the morning too. <laughs> uh, because these are, of course, really, uh, the really complicated things. But I have, there will be, because uh, Davis will have a, a lead the question and answers uh, uh, by the end of this meeting. But I still would like some short comments, yours. Um, 
shipping, you didn't mention, but it should be on its way in the pipeline in. Um, did I hear you loud and clear saying that you think of the financial market review and the, and the enhanced market oversight that it's better to encompass the ETS system in the sort of current framework? Uh, in that case, I'm very happy to hear that because I think for the market, it's better if you have well-known definitions, well-known ways of, of doing things, well-known prohibitions and well-known functioning of the system. Uh, and in, in case, just add one or two details for, for the specifics, specifics of uh, the emission trading system. Um, and on, I think what we would need, I mean, you talk about the, the fund for, for CCS and for new market entrants and so on, uh, but we, what we would need, I think, for the industry and for us uh, as uh, legislators, a sort of communication of where the money is and how it's working, an update. Uh, Fiona Hall and I ha has looked on the set plan a lot, and it's only financed to like 50% of, of what we estimated and the decisions we took. So an, an, uh, an overview of what is happening and where the money really is, we discussed this. Is EIB really doing what it should do when it comes to, to uh, new technology, or is it just going for security? And I mean, if, if you as a bank go for 100% security on your loans, there is new technical innovation because it's all well-known facts and all technology in that case. So uh, shipping, financial, and, and financing. Well, on shipping, um, we said that we would regulate in the EU if we do not have any movement whatsoever at the level of the international uh, institution, which is the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. Uh, we are having um, intensified talks with the sector at the highest level, I have to say, in order to prepare what is uh, possible. There is still a route that is very much favored by uh, uh, major players in the industry, which is a charging or taxing system that could raise part of the revenue that uh, is on the table, and that was uh, pledged, in fact, in Copenhagen. Uh, so that financial route is being investigated. If that is not materializing, it will be for the EU to make a decision. And uh, we are uh, investigating all options, so the taxing charging route, a regulatory instruments route, but also inclusion of the ETS. So these are the three options we are working about, uh, but we want to give full uh, encouragement to what is happening at the IMO. Um, we, we are worried that pro progress at the IMO level is not as fast as we hoped for, uh, like we saw under ICAO uh, for aviation. So it's very important that on ICAO we can steam ahead with inclusion of aviation as decided through co-decision. There is no way to, uh, to deviate from that, but I think that also ICAO took uh, almost two decades of letters with vague promises not doing anything, and now it's delivery time. We have to insist on that. On the MIFID and the MAD directives, I, I, I fully agree with you, but there are some specificities that we will have to build in. So it's always a bit of a gray zone. Either you go for a self-standing regime that is reflecting or um, having uh, lots of elements from the financial sector, or you include yourself into the financial sector with a number of caveats that uh, industrial comp companies uh, not being on the trading floor every day have a, an easier access and have some easier um, uh, obligations compared to what the MIFID and the MAD directive foresees now. But we are um, working uh, very hard on that and we have uh, excellent cooperation with uh, our colleagues from the DG Markt and, uh, and, and, and Commissioner Barnier. Um, on CCS um, and, and the funding, um, tracking the funding, of course the funding happens only in the new system as of 1st of January 2013. Uh, so far, we have a completely subsidiarized system up until 2013, but we would like to be ready with the monitoring mechanism well before the 1st of January 2013 in order to have a, a very clear tracking of what is happening, where the money is going, and, um, and it, while it's going to be the subject of, uh, of some discussion in, in both houses, in Council and Parliament, um, it is a very strong commitment that Council and Parliament were making at the time of the Climate and Energy Package. And, and that's why we feel um, in the Commission that we have to put it into the monitoring mechanism to have full clarity 
on a yearly basis what is happening with the money. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Chris, do you have any further comments before we move on? Reuters yesterday says that the European Union's carbon market could be flooded with excess pollution permits over the next decade, cutting prices in half and depriving governments of billions in budgeted revenues. Quote, there is a real concern of negative impacts on prices if the issue is not properly addressed. Some of the studies imply that the carbon prices will collapse, an EU source said on condition of anonymity. <laughs> Further down in this article, there's someone called Sanjeev Kumar quoted. Um, and oh the <laughs> article, article also refers to turf wars between DG Energy, uh, which is seeking lower carbon prices and um, climate action. I mean, the, but the, 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 basic art, the basic problem, of course, is simply that although we may be achieving lower CO2 prices as a result of the e lower CO2 reductions from the plants within the ETS, the, 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 the low... The, the long-term tracking, for, there was no confidence that carbon prices are going to rise to a level which will drive forward low-carbon investments on the scale needed. Yeah, we, we are aware about uh, the, uh, the, the, the problem. And, and of course, uh, some of the scenarios you are quoting are, uh, seem to me rather extreme. But it is true that uh, there is a policy, a fundamental policy question on the table. Um, there is the carbon market. And um, the dissatisfaction with some elements of the carbon market seems some people to, uh, uh, to toy with additional instruments, additional instruments in terms of uh, energy efficiency uh, standards or in terms of taxation, the debate in the UK on the floor price, for example, um, or other regulatory instruments. Um, we are relatively cautious on that, and we say if we go for these instruments, we have to make sure that they work together, that one is not undermining the other. And that is where um, we in DG Climate Action made the point, um, if in case we want to uh, go for energy efficiency instruments in the sector covered by the ETS, uh, the success of that policy needs to lead to a set aside of some of the allowances. Otherwise, the carbon market price is going to go down and the efforts that are done to improve energy efficiency are going to be undermined through a lower carbon price. So it's a, it's a question of a, a good compatibility between the two instruments. Um, th this question is, is, is currently debated in the, in, in, inside the European Commission. It's going to land on, on your table uh, uh, one day uh, because it's an instrument, it's a, it's a, a proposal for a directive that is going to be adopted through co-decision. So it's, uh, it's, it's a start of a debate. It's not easy to explain to people, but it is a tendency uh, that we see that um, uh, people are just trying to pile up one after the other instrument, and we are a bit worried that uh, uh, the better regulation for which we all stand may be undermined in case we are not doing it in a clever way. Food for thought. Okay, we come back to this <laughs> a number of times. Now, uh, going over to the Euroelectric uh, and uh, how you can support this, uh, I, I, uh, um, I do hope that uh, the, or I know that some people are, are mildly astonished to see the position of the Euroelectric. Let's see if that's the case in this, uh, in this uh, room. And uh, John Shawcroft is, of course, uh, uh, the speaker. He is leading these activities on, on climate and energy in Euroelectric and has a long career and a long experience on this topic. So I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Lena, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, two thoughts struck me. One was you said we were at the centre of the debate, and yet you put me on the far left. Um, and the other, the other thought is that speaking after Joss is always a pain because he's just given my speech. Um, but I'd like to set the scene before I start because um, the first, can I have the first slide, please? Because I think the first point, the first point to make is where we're coming from in the electricity industry, electricity or power. I'm not quite sure which is the right word. 
Um, some two years ago, some 61 of our CEOs, representing about 75% of, of power generation in Europe, undertook to move their companies to carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, and they did that on the basis of uh, an integrated market and using energy efficiency and electricity as the solutions to mitigate climate change. We reinforced that in the next slide, please, back in February when we issued a statement uh, for the, the February the 4th Council meeting where we said quite clearly that the emissions trading scheme should become the essential driver. So that's where I'm coming from. The simple answer to the question posed is yes, there is a role for the ETS. Um, now, I've got another couple of slides before I, I move on. Can I see the next one? Which is, um, we did not a roadmap, we had a pathway. A roadmap implies you know what the road is. A pathway gives a vision of pushing through the jungle and trying to find the most effective way of getting, getting to the other end. So after the CEOs, and I, quote, I emphasize, after the CEOs had made their commitment, we decided to do a study, which was a follow-up on an earlier one, to see actually whether carbon neutrality was an economically uh, feasible issue for us to, to undertake. So ne next slide, please. Using the same model that uh, everyone else uses, we set some parameters in that model. Uh, this was back in 2009, so we were a little more modest about the reduction target because we were then at the top end of what was the EU's target of 60 to 80 percent. So we set a 75 percent domestic uh, target for the whole EU economy. Um, two reasons. Uh, we thought it was easier to sort it out by doing it domestically. Uh, and the other dirty little secret <clears throat> is that the, the model doesn't do offsets. So uh, we, uh, we stuck to a, a domestic um, target. We also assumed that a CO2 price would be applied uniformly across all sectors, and that electricity would become a major transport fuel. We were able to use all generation options, and that CCS would be available commercially as of 2025. Um, nuclear was in there, but we, like the Commission's roadmap, had the German phase out in there. Underpinning this was a major push on energy efficiency. And I think anyone who looks at both the, the results of power choices and any other work will see that unless there is a, a real major push on energy efficiency, these targets are going to be very expensive to meet. I think we're just arguing about how you push energy efficiency at the moment rather than whether you should push energy efficiency. Um, I'll come back to this a bit later. We also said that after 2020, there would be no binding renewables targets, uh, and that as of 2030, there would be no support for renewables. In, e in effect, by 2030, the CO2 price, or rather the cap that, that comes from this trajectory, would be the only driver for investment in low carbon technologies. Um, we also assumed using another model that there would be, by 2030, some kind of global carbon market. So there was a global price feeding into there. Now, what was the result of that? And a lot of the results you've already seen because the Commission's um, roadmap is remarkably similar to ours. So you can have the next slide. Um, what happens is we have a 90% reduction in emissions from the power sector by applying the, these um, parameters. The final energy mix is some over 50% renewables, and the rest is split between um, nuclear carbon capture on m most fossil fuels with a bit of unabated gas at the end, which is required for um, f following the res load. But you'll see that from about 1.2 billion tonnes that we emit now, we're down to about 150 million tonnes uh, in 2050 which is why a high carbon price in 2050 is not so much of a concern because we have to buy less of it. So there is a perfect logic in, in, in what is happening. So that's really why I'm setting the scene and trying to explain why we regard ETS as being the main driver. And I thought I'd spend some time on sort of 
trying to address the issue, why do people think it won't deliver? And the first thing I think I want to do is to try and settle a confusion that is, and I think we all fell for it, is when we first introduced and started talking about the ETS, we said it's quite simple, set a cap, the price will come out and people invest. I think there is a difference. The cap is what actually drives investment. If you know that in 2030, 2040, that is the amount of emissions you will have to, will you'll be allowed to emit, you start building your investment around that. The price is something that comes out of the current target. It's something, in fact, that informs you as to how you're going to meet the current cap and how you're going to operate your existing assets. As, as a long-term investing industry, uh, even by 2020, what's going to be generating in 2020 is either being built or planned to be built now. So we can't make rapid changes between now and 2020. <clears throat> Any additional target that is set for 2020 will be met by and large by existing assets. So it's a question of how you use your existing assets. And I think a lot of the argument about where ETS is going is because people are not making that separation between what the cap is meant to do and what the, the price is a reflection of what is the current situation. So if I have one criticism of ETS at the, mo at the moment, one major criticism, and that is the lack of long-term visibility. We need to know what 2030 and 2040 and 2050 will be in a way that is, I was going to say binding, probably that's a loose use of the word, but it's binding. Because quite frankly, now, if you go into a boardroom and say, <clears throat> they say, well, what's the cap going to be in 2030? And you start explaining 1.74%, um, you tend to lose attention very rapidly. And people say, OK, the cap's 20% in 2020. That's what we'll deal with. So the long-term visibility is a key, key issue for us. It will give the certainty we need. Um, incidentally, the other thing about ETS is it will actually deliver the target. The penalty is set sufficiently high and dissuasive to encourage people to meet the cap. It's somewhere what <clears throat> a tonne that is not covered by an allowance now is worth about 117 euros now. So um, there are some technologies out there which you can build for even for 117 euros. So clearly the cap will be met. But I think one thing we have to recognise is that it won't bring non-commercial technologies to the market. ETS really is designed to identify the next commercially available technology on the market, which is why we, uh, we work fairly closely with Chris on the CCS directive, because we recognise that if you looked at what the price of CCS would be, if you had to bring it to market now, you didn't know but you knew it was a hell of a lot. And you would go from something like 15 euros to 60 euros, which the market couldn't handle. Therefore, if you have a non-commercial technology, you need something to supplement the ETS. ETS is dealing with what's available on the market, not what might be available on the market. So I think that's another issue that we need to address. When I talk about commercial technologies, I think I, uh, and Joss gave me the chance to do it legitimately. Um, I need to say something about res. Because it's clear, renewables, it's clear that the, the subsidies and res targets are having a depressing effect on the carbon market and on the electricity market. But the main issue, I think, about renewables is not so much, this is a personal opinion, I'm not speaking on behalf of your electric here, please. The main issue, although we'll probably get up there in the end, but the main issue is not so much the subsidy, but it's the isolation of renewables from the market. Priority access is one issue, but it seems to me that one of the main problems about renewables and the electricity market is that any other one, any other technology that builds has to have a customer. Your business plan says, um, I'm going to build this plant because I've got so many contracts in place. It's the whole issue of hedging. Renewables don't have that. 
they don't also have the responsibility of providing backup when the wind doesn't blow. That's a responsibility for everyone else. So in, in essence, I think the depressing effect renewables is having on the market is simply because they're not in the market. And I, I can't argue that we should subsidise CCS, but we shouldn't subsidise renewables unless those renewables are market ready. So I think one of the issues is integrating renewables in the market. And certainly that is something we're going to come out with. But I think one of the main problems that we have with ETS is not the, the scheme, not the design of the scheme, but it's the regulatory uncertainty that surrounds it. We have, in the short term, no clarity on the timetable for early auctions, if there are going to be early auctions, the timetable for when the NER 300 are going to come to market, no certainty about what and when the auctioning platforms are going to look like, and to a large extent, we have worries over both the registry and market oversight. All of this is bringing uncertainty into the market, and it's not within the market, it's the regulatory oversight that is the issue. Um, and if it's not, if these issues aren't resolved, the operators are going to be, begin to lose confidence in the whole system. Um, I think I ought to say a word about some of the alternatives. If you accept that ETS won't deliver, which I don't, you have to look at, well, what are you going to put in its place? I say we have, as a given, that we are moving to a carbon neutral process system by 2050. Well, what are the alternatives? Well, clearly taxes are one alternative. And I have to say we, uh, we do welcome the proposal in the revision of the energy taxation to introduce a CO2 price for other parts of the economy. It will allow um, electricity to compete in the heating and cooling domestic markets on a level footing, assuming the tax actually delivers what it's intended to deliver, which is a price, uh, a carbon price on other technologies. But if you're going to have a tax, um, can you deliver it at EU level? Or will it just distort markets? And what level would you set a tax to deliver the target? That's got to be a guess by policymakers. You know, what is the right price for commercial CCS, for renewables? But for res, or do you have a series of different taxes to encourage different technologies? Um, then you move on to command and control. Um, I've read the recent, I've skimmed the recent publication, which it seems to me, from from DG Klima, seems to line up with where we are. Um, it has a sort of legitimacy, but actually, it won't make any difference. Where, where, if you're going to set a, a, an emission level, where would you set it? Logic said you would set it at what commercial CCS would deliver. Um, but we don't have commercial CCS, so where do you set it? Maybe set it somewhere that just encourages gas. Um, but quite frankly, if you set it anywhere else, you're going to just encourage a switch to gas. And there are security supply issues behind that. I think it's economically efficient as well. The case is entirely different from um, BREFs and BAT. The technologies there are commercially available. You're actually trying to drive a technology that is not available, or you're trying to drive a technology that exists uh, but is a single activity. And I think one of the, the real problems that we are facing is our attraction with ETS is it sets us the target and says you go out and deliver it and you discover the most economically efficient way of doing it. Setting um, requirements to use a certain technology, I mean, there, is, there is something floater, floating around that applies that all new thermal power plants will have to be CHP, whether there's a heat load or not. So we have a tremendous problem with that. We have any, a problem with anything that defines a specific technology. All options will have to be needed, and in our view, the ETS is the best way of enabling those technologies, those most economic te uh, technologies to be discovered and delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll 
take questions on this in the overall question and answers uh, session. Now, Giles Dixon, Alstom. Um, innovation, new products, new uh, market models, maybe? And how do you look at the ETS system from your point of view? Thank you very much indeed. New products. It's an interesting thought. Exactly 100 years ago today, one of the most exciting new products the world had ever seen was launched from a shipyard in Titan in Belfast. Uh, Twelve months later, of course, it had sunk. I hope we can uh, uh, give a slightly more upbeat uh, picture of today's uh, crucial new technologies for decarbonizing the power sector. Uh, thank you very much. My company, Alstom, is basically in the business of delivering the low-carbon economy. We do three things. We provide grid equipment, connecting renewables to uh, the electricity consumers. We build power stations. We provide technology and equipment for one quarter of all of the world's power stations. And we build trains, trams, and uh, metros, good low-carbon stuff. In September this year, you'll be able to ride on the fastest train in Europe at 360 kilometers an hour if you go from Milan to Rome, saving significant volumes of CO2. Let me give you a few more specific examples of projects that we're currently involved with in the power sector to decarbonize electricity generation in Europe. In the UK, we are building the UK's largest onshore wind farm at the moment. In Poland, we are retrofitting Europe's largest power station, the Belhatov plant, making it more thermally efficient, significantly reducing the CO2 emissions from that plant in the process. And in France, we're helping to operate what is Europe's largest operating carbon capture and storage plant today, both capturing CO2 from 30 megawatts of generation and storing it successfully in a gas field uh, under the plant with 90% levels of local public support, uh, I stress. We have 55,000 employees in Europe. Uh, not all of what they make is sold or consumed in Europe. One third of it goes outside of Europe. And I stress this point because we are an example of one of those companies that people like to talk about or envisage or imagine when they talk about the green industrial revolution in Europe and Europe carving out an industrial niche in low carbon technologies that can be a basis for Europe's future prosperity. One third of our employees are producing low carbon kit for the global economy. Each of those jobs has three further jobs in our supply chain. So if you work the numbers back, we have 55,000 people in Europe who are producing green kit for the export market for the rest of the world. Now, the scale of the challenge that we are facing. This is a slide that you will all be familiar with. It shows what we need to do between now and 2050 to decarbonize the power sector globally. We need to do a lot of energy efficiency. That's the light blue chunk at the bottom. We need to do a lot of renewables. 20% of it is CCS. There's some nuclear in there as well. Um, I actually prefer to look at this image, which tells us what we need to do between now and 2030 rather than 2050. John, I'm sure you would agree, most of your members are not really thinking about their investments in a 2050 perspective, but they are beginning to think about them for a 2030 perspective. Now, if we want to stabilize global emissions, be on a track to stabilizing them at 450 parts per million by 2030, this is what we need to do globally in the power sector. The yellow chart on the left-hand side is global power sector emissions today. The chart next to it is where they will be in 2030 if we do nothing, if we carry on at business as usual. But if we want to combat climate change, we actually need to get those emissions down to the yellow chart on the right-hand side here, 8.5 gigatons by 2030. And you can see there are five steps that we need to take in the power sector to get us from business as usual down to the level of emissions, which will enable us to stabilize uh, at 450 ppm. The good news here is that all the technology that we need in order to do these five things is ready. It's available. It's done its R&D. It's not yet being deployed for two reasons, which I will come on to shortly. 
In my own company, we like to condense those five steps down to something that we call uh, the holy trinity, three things that we need to do to decarbonize power. We need a better technology mix, more renewables and as much nuclear as is uh, politically uh, and technically and economically feasible. Um, we need more energy efficiency, not just on the demand side, but also on the supply side. Power stations are notoriously inefficient. Transmission networks are inefficient. 7% of all the electricity that goes into Europe's transmission networks is lost before it even gets to the distribution networks, let alone to the customer. And the third part of our holy trinity, carbon capture and storage. And as a company, we're offering all of these technologies, as you can see, a number of renewables uh, technologies, uh, as well as uh, cleaner uh, solutions to the more conventional forms of power generation, uh, coal, oil, and uh, gas. The coal, the clean coal, of course, including CCS. As I said a moment ago, the problem we have at the moment is that the investments are not happening on the scale we need in order to decarbonize the power sector. This shows you the volume of investments up until 2009. Um, not bad, there was some growth up to 2007 and then it uh, tapered off. On the right hand side, and this is not actually to scale, that red chart should be way off the top of the slide. That's the level of investments we need in Europe by 2020 in order to get ourselves on the pathway we need to decarbonize. That's $140 billion, excuse me using US dollars here, per annum investments in the power sector in Europe. At the moment, 2009, we're at $44 billion. So we are less than one third of where we actually need to be. Now, why do we have these problems? Well, the most important reason is that the ETS is not fulfilling its function at the moment to drive investments in clean power generation. And it's not fulfilling that function for a variety of reasons. The cap has not been uh, tight enough. We strongly support, of course, the improvements that have been made uh, for phase three of the ETS, the tightening of the cap. We also support the idea that the Commission has left on the table in its 2050 roadmap that if it proves necessary that the cap should be further tightened still between 2013 and 2020 by setting aside a number of allowances, not least to offset the reduced scarcity in the carbon market that is likely to come from the EU delivering on energy efficiency. But there's another reason why the investments are, are not happening, and that is because the technologies which I've talked about, all of which are available, they've done their R&D, are too expensive at the moment. They are still on their learning curves. The costs still have a long way to fall. Let me give you one small example of this and link it back to the ETS. Carbon capture and storage. On the left-hand side of the chart, that's how much CCS costs today in terms of the euros for every ton of CO2 avoided. We are confident as a company that is supplying CO2 capture technology, and CO2 capture is about 80% of the costs of doing CCS, we are confident that those costs are going to come down. You can see the dark blue and the red charts there uh, charting the envisaged fall in the costs of CCS, and those are total costs, including transport and storage. Um, the light blue line, of course, is the carbon price, and it's the carbon price that is expected by the UK's Treasury. This is not any old uh, prediction. Apologies, Joss, for not having taken one of your models. We chose to take a more recent model, uh, an interesting model put forward by the UK government in their recent consultation on electricity market reform in the UK. And that shows that by 2025, at least, the carbon price should be at the same level as the costs of doing CCS. So by 2025, CCS should be economically viable. But there's a 15-year gap between now and then, during which the carbon price is too low. Of course, it will go up with the tightening. And of course, the costs of CCS will come down. But how do we get over that particular gap? The tightening of the ETS is great and is essential for getting us to that meeting point in 2025. But there are a few things we need to do between now and then to cover that gap. The first is, as Joss has already mentioned, we need to mobilize additional public funding to support CCS and other low-carbon technologies. 
And key here are the auction revenues that are going to be coming in to the member states' treasuries from 2013. And they will be extremely high value, about 20 billion euros every year. And as Joss has said, one half of them should uh, be invested in uh, climate and energy goals. Secondly, we believe that CCS, this is just one example of a technology, should be supported by feed-in tariff support, just in the way that renewables are supported by feed-in tariffs. The UK has already proposed this. Romania has proposed it. Um, a number of other member states are, uh, we believe, going to be uh, looking at this. There should be a level playing field between all low-carbon uh, technologies. And thirdly, there needs to be, alongside the ETS price support system, some sort of regulatory push that drives investment in these technologies that still have a long way to go on their learning curve, as I say, and where the costs still have a long way to fall to make them economically viable. A regulatory push. You might be thinking, what do I have in mind? Surely the EU ETS is enough. Well, if the EU ETS were enough, we would not have a renewable energy directive in the EU. That is providing a regulatory push to drive investment in renewables. If the EU ETS were enough on its own, the Commission would not be now bringing forward a new energy savings directive to help drive investments in energy efficiency. Similarly, you could say the EU would not have a CCS directive. Of course, we need a legal framework uh, for the deployment of CCS. We believe that directive, when it is reviewed in 2015, should be amended so that it provides a regulatory driver to support the investment in CCS, just as the Renewable Energy Directive drives investments in renewables. So that is it. In the long term, the ETS is looking good as it is currently structured, provided, as I say, the set-aside option is kept in play. In the short term, it will need to be supplemented by some regulatory drivers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just a, a short question. Uh, on on this, uh, if we look at waste gases, uh, they are not used as you might think they should be uh, in, with the current price system and, and whatever we have in place because the investment horizon is in some companies six or seven, or the payback time is six or seven years and internal targets are payback time three or four years. Um, and, of course, uh, looking at the financial crisis and all the problems we have to save in Europe today, it's very easy to ask for more money to do things that has to be done. Um, Jostel Becker mentioned the mandatory targets in 10 years' time for CCS. And, and uh, looking at all the needs we have to go further than... I mean, we have the, the money in the... Set, in the uh, for new entrants and the five billions and so on in the ETS system, but you are asking for more. Uh, I think that would be quite difficult, actually, uh, considering uh, the financial environments that we are in in Europe right now. And um, it seems like uh, we have from the industry, industry side criticism on, on uh, um, helping the renewables to get over the sort of threshold into the market. Um, um, and, and now you're asking for, for public money. I, f I find this a bit uh, peculiar. Would you like me to answer your point now? Well, say, just say yes and I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, that's what you, that's what you will meet in, in this house. <laughs> well, additional public funding is needed between now and 2025 2030 to make all low carbon technologies commercially viable that is why nearly all member states of the eu are today investing huge amounts of money in feed-in tariff support for renewables and most of those support schemes despite the current fiscal conditions are remaining in place they may be slightly reduced but they are remaining in place the uk country that uh, likes to be in the policy vanguard on these sort of issues is actually extending its feed-in tariff support scheme now to all low-carbon technologies, including uh, CCS, uh, and in fact including nuclear. 
Uh, other member states are looking to do the same thing. Now, yes, the fiscal conditions are tight, but from 2013, as I said, suddenly the finance ministries of Europe are going to find themselves with 20 billion euros new income which they are not currently getting from the auction revenues. So all we are saying is that those auction revenues should be deployed in a way that supports the deployment of low-carbon technologies in a way that is in compliance with existing EU legislation, the 50% point. And without that, we will not get ourselves on the necessary path to decarbonisation. And we don't think that that is an unreasonable demand. And let me give you one final answer. We've not deployed, any of us so far, the industrial policy case for doing all of this. I talked briefly about the number of people we employ in Europe uh, and the fact that they are exporting from Europe uh, to third countries. At the moment, European industry has still a strong position vis-à-vis -vis its competitors in the development of low-carbon energy technologies, but that position is under threat. It is under threat from China, which is investing hugely in the expansion of its industrial capacity and where the banks are able to yep. lend money with much greater facility to support investments than they are here in Europe. It is happening in Korea and it is happening in Japan. Korea spent 81% of their fiscal stimulus on low carbon products and services. Now, if we do not match that, we will find ourselves without this European industrial niche here in Europe. We won't be able to export, and ultimately it will be Chinese, Korean, Japanese industry that is helping us decarbonize our power sector here, and we will suffer industrially and economically as a result. Or we could have a mandatory target. <laughs> okay, uh, Sanjeev uh, from e E3G. Uh, you worked with uh, these issues for a long time, and quoted in Financial Times and so on, which is the sort of uh, um, I wouldn't say quality branding, but <laughs> not always, but in your case it is, of course. <laughs> thank you, Lady. You're, Please, you're, you have the floor. You're flattering me. Uh, thank you, Lady and Chris, for giving us an opportunity to come and talk to you. Um, we've heard a lot of information already, a lot of very provocative statements, um, if you read between the lines. And I've, I was going to go in a bit more detail about what the political choices are around the ETS, but I just can't resist uh, jumping in for, for, for one second and actually just explaining the context. We've heard a lot about uh, what's going on in the world, about the recession, the, the kind of constraints in people's pockets. What we haven't heard about is the sheer anger on the streets that you're seeing. You don't have to be in North Africa. You only have to go to a country like Spain where you have people who are camped out in the streets now for about a couple of weeks saying, give us a future. You know, you, you look around the, the world at the moment, everybody has been subsidised, all the big corporations, left, right and centre, money has been thrown at them. Yet it's the everyday man and woman in the street who's saying, hold on a second, it's my future, I'm the one who's paying. I'm the one who pays if you make the wrong investments, Mr Power Sector, Mr Your Electric, because I'm the one who's going to have to pay extra to undo the work that you've just done. I'm the one who's going to, to suffer from the uh, uh, impacts of climate change when it happens. I'm also going to have to pay for the increased cost of climate change as it, as it affects my livelihoods. So you're going to start to see a lot more unrest and a lot more uh, unease with people just asking basic questions, which is, you know, no more easy rides for corporations. What we want are real hard investments on the ground. And what you see from the uh, European Emissions Trading Scheme um, at the moment is, 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 is a phenomenal dichotomy. On the one hand, um, if you're a big uh, um, a steel maker, for example, you've made an absolute fortune from the Emissions Trading Scheme, and you, can, you will carry on doing that because you're going to scream and shout. If you're power companies, you've made an absolute fortune. What you haven't done is seen investments in the steel sector. We haven't seen massive investments in the chemical sector across Europe. We certainly haven't seen the, the scale of investments in the power generation sector. Um, so what we now need to do is just to ask ourselves a fundamental question. If the ETS is going to deliver, then it needs to start delivering sooner rather than later because effectively the confidence will, will, will wane away. And we won't be looking at 2030. We won't be looking at 2015. We'll be talking about a different directive and a different driver. And that, oddly enough, is what we have on the table now. The 
whether it's a turf war or, or just a misalignment within the Commission, they're already looking at replacing the ETS through the Energy Efficiency uh, Directive. Now, um, we have, you know, and, and that's just a start of the discussion. There'll be many more solutions that come on. But what you're also starting to see is member states um, having discussions. You've, you've already got in the UK um, a, a, a carbon taxation scheme. So they're already protecting their financial uh, uh, um, uh, value of each ETS allowance um, through a floor price. You have um, lots of governments now from the Czech Republic to Poland uh, to the UK, even Germany, looking at the, 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 the shape and the nature of their, their energy mix um, already. And what they're doing is, is looking at it from a very national perspective. And that's, that's very good because it at least allows them to have some control over where their own destiny is. But if we're looking at a bigger, broader European decarbonisation, then the picture is going to get messier. Um, we also have um, some some member states. Um, so, you know, we, we we have a whole series of member states looking at uh, different options. What we have to do is just to find a way in which we can take that back to a European level and give it that overarching. Um, uh, direction perspective. The ETS is one option. Uh, the energy efficiency legislation, if it does actually look at creating a European market for energy efficiency, might actually be a contribution. But at the moment, the draft of the directive is looking, again, at devolving all of the responsibilities down to the member states. And that's not helping us in the long run. So so we have a, a, a simple choice. Do we, do we have one final push at getting the ETS right now, which is the set-aside proposal that, that um, has been mentioned already, or do we look at other instruments that simply displace the ETS altogether? Um, and you can you can start to see you can start to see some of those options already on the cards. The emission performance standard, disappointing that the, the speakers on the panel today have only referred to it in the context of coal. Um, if we are going to have targets for 2030, 2040, and 2050 that are technology neutral, then the most obvious instrument is an emission performance standard because that's how you will deliver energy efficiency, but that's also how you will deliver your renewable targets. And I think we need to, to unlock the, the unhelpful report that Joss's department uh, produced um, and actually have a much deeper debate around the emission performance standard and to see whether this is the kind of thing that can fit into either the resource efficiency agenda that's coming up or more practically, more immediately, the energy uh, efficiency directive that's, that's going to land within a couple of weeks. Um, the next option, and this is quite an interesting one because this kind of gives us an idea of how DG Energy approaches the roadmap. Um, if their intention is to... Uh, to not support the, the, the a correction of the ETS prior to 2020, then by definition they're putting all of their emphasis on energy efficiency and renewables. And that's a very welcome thing. Um, what that does mean, though, is, is that we are then going to have to have a, a 2030, 2040 and a 2050 renewables target and, importantly, energy efficiency targets. Um, and that's an additional level of certainty that John Scowcroft and Euroelectric, the predictability that they need is important. And I'm sure that they will support that. But the crucial thing for us is everything that's outside uh, the, the, those specific directives. And the ETS is one of those spaces that can fix it. So what we really have to do is to go back and have a, have a, a, a better understanding of what the set aside is, but more importantly, why do we need the set aside? Um, uh, and before we go into that, um, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of a member state, you have spent a lot of political capital developing the emissions trading scheme. You're finally, you're, you're uh, 18 months away from getting massive win for, for profits of uh, euros coming into your coffers, um, and there's a potential to wipe those out almost instantly by not aligning European legislation. So for, if I was a member state now, I would be extremely panicked, I would be extremely concerned, I would be thinking of following the line that some of the other member states are, are pursuing of setting my own reserve price or ensuring some way that I at least get the value from the ETS allowances that I want because, you know, if an allowance is worth 30 euros uh, two years ago, it's 15 euros today, it's zero within a couple of months, then that's quite clearly the, the daftest investment. So we absolutely have to capture this at a European level in order to have a European debate around what the prices. And actually, what's interesting is on the reserve price option, 
um, is that actually a lot of a lot of the players within the e-test debate have kind of all ga gravitated around the 30 euro mark. If you look at the industrial sectors led by Business Europe, they were very very keen when the carbon leakage assessment was being done to have the 30 euro as the benchmark. They accepted the 30 euro price. Uh, the Commission's impact assessments in 2008 and subsequently have all looked at the 30 euro carbon price. So that's the kind of remit we want to move back into. That's the the, the the, the cost that we've accepted, and that's certainly what the set-aside should be looking at doing. Um, so what, what actually is the set-aside then? Um, it can work in different ways. I've just listed a couple on the, on the, on the, 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 the sheet behind us. Um, what we're effectively doing is, is taking out some allowances that were going to be auctioned to the power sector. As John Scowcroft and Neuroelectric have already said, the, the, the power sector accepts that it needs to decarbonize it accepts that it needs to take a bigger share of the burden um, than other sectors um, and more importantly it also recognizes um, that it's going to be one of the chief beneficiaries obviously as the transport sector decarbonizes that's a greater demand for the products and services that it produces so it wins handsomely um, and it's disappointing that your electric aren't able to be more more clear on what they're actually asking for rather than looking at 2050 when we need to have some certainty from the industry as to what regulation they back. If they back the ETS, you must back the set aside. If you don't back the ETS, then back the energy efficiency, but back something. Sitting in the middle means you just get run over by traffic in both directions. Um, when we look at the, the, the set aside, there's, there's a couple of options that, that, that can happen. Once, once the allowances are taken out of the system, it just means that they're not going to be um, auctioned uh, uh, in the period up until 2020. And you've got a couple of issues. You can either um, delete the allowances, and that by definition will make the carbon price higher. Um, and uh, the, the value of the allowances that have been deleted will be recuperated by the higher income that you make. That's, that's one option. The other option is to just simply put the, those allowances into a long-term savings investment uh, account. And this is the kind of thing that you and I do on a regular basis. I have a, a, a seven-year uh, account where I put money in and I can't take it out. Um, we already have a precedent that's going to happen along this lines with the European Energy Efficiency Fund where money from the European budget will be set aside for 23 years to finance energy efficiency improvements and the money will then be returned to member states in 23 years time um, at the same value that they put it in in the first place. So that's an important precedent and that's the kind of thinking that, that, that we should be applying because this ultimately is less about emission reductions but more about how we get value for money from the commercial asset of an ETS allowance, but more importantly, how we actually get the money to pay for the decarbonisation that we want. And that's that's quite crucial. Where the money comes from is, is a vital element. Um, the, the third option is to simply put the allowances into um, a, a separate registry within the registry that Joss, uh, the European registry that Joss was talking about a few moments ago, uh, with a view that there, there will be some decision on cancelling the allowances um, after 2020. What that does is, it, by taking the allowances out of the market pre-2020, you've strengthened the ETS and you've given it a purpose and a drive. And what you should start to see is a much deeper and stronger discussion around how we're going to spend the, the increased auction revenues. Now, um, if we can, you know, if we can look at the the, 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 the potential impacts of a set aside, is it such a bad thing? Well, if you're a member state, what do you what do you get from it? You you get more revenue. Um, for a start, you're protecting the, the commercial value of your uh, allowances and you're protecting them across a European approach rather than unilaterally introducing a, a, a tax to, to, to recuperate the revenue like the UK. Um, if you're an industrial sector, again, you make you, you make a, a even bigger windfall profits, one would expect. Um, a lot of evidence has come from the Commission, but also from independent uh, researchers such as uh, New Carbon Finance, um, that most of the industrial sectors are, have enough allowances to see them through until 2020. Um, we, we even have evidence from companies like ArcelorMittal, the big steel company. Um, they're so confident with their over allocation. They've been selling allowances for the last couple of years and have raised something like 200 uh, uh, billion euros um, over the night. So, so everyone seems to be very comfortable with the, the volume of allowances that they have from the industrial perspective. And obviously, if you are going to sell your allowances, you'd want to sell them at 30 euros rather than 15 euros if you're a profit-maximizing company. 
Um, if you're a power, if you're in the power sector, what what kind of advantages does that give you? That tells you firstly that the ETS is actually a serious player um, up until 2020, and that therefore you should start taking seriously what the 1.74 percent uh, trajectory uh, going to 2050 would look like. But also that this is this is the key uh, uh, driver for those long-term investments that Euroelectric were were talking about later on. If you're an innovator, um, then there, there are two benefits, as, as we've already heard. Firstly, you have a clear signal and a commitment that Europe is actually going to decarbonise, um, and that it is going to create the low-carbon markets, such as those for transport, but also in the in the heating sector. So there's a lot of opportunity to bring forward the, the, the technologies, but also with the higher revenue going into member states, recapturing that money and using that to drive... Uh, uh, greater commercial uh, demonstration of, of the more expensive technologies, again, helps speed the whole process up. So you're a winner from that side. Um, if you're an employee, the average man on the street, what do you get? Well, you firstly get some belief that you, your, your concerns have been taken seriously, that there will be action to decarbonise the European economy, and more importantly, that there will be the opportunities from the low-carbon markets and the hundreds of thousands and billions of jobs that are talked about are actually going to start materialising. So if you're an angry young 18-year-old, you actually have a future. Um, it's, worth going to it's worth studying, it's worth having and believing in the system uh, that we have here in Europe. Those, those, are, those are very powerful motivators. Um, and if your society, from a, from a broader societal perspective, this is fantastic news. This is, this is belief that the European uh, uh, legislative system does actually work in the interest of Europe um, and that we can actually have a common collective approach rather than allowing each and every member state, or dare I say region, going ahead and doing their own thing. Um, so what I've done here is, is, is talk a little bit about why you would do a set-aside, how you could possibly do a set-aside. Um, and I hope we can maybe get into some of the detailed politics about where we would do the set-aside decision. Would you, for example, and maybe this is an open question to, to the panel, uh, maybe to, to, to Lena and Chris as well, do we think the Energy Efficiency Directive is an opportunity to have the first legislative discussion around um, the set-aside proposal? Do we think we should wait for a new directive to come from the Commission? Um, or do we simply wait for the member states at the, the heads of state council to simply make a political agreement that they will adjust the ETS the same way we have adjusted the ETS on numerous occasions just recently for the for the power generation sector to allow them to have some early auctioning um, of phase three allowances. These are, these are simple decisions that need to be made. There are a lot of opportunities to make them um, and everybody wins from it. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, <clears throat> uh, very interesting. A uh, lot of complicated issues in, uh, in the short term <laughs> uh, presentation. And what you're proposing is really having the, the roof being lowered in the ETS system. Uh, you are proposing a sort of periodic internal ceiling <laughs> to bring the levels down to, so that we can <coughs> get on the right trajectory for the climate targets. Uh, without being specific on the exact methods uh, uh, and proposing, you have three options. So I think this is very interesting. And saying this, I will turn, uh, <laughs> turn <clears throat> over to Chris Davis, who will lead the uh, question and answers. And you will <clears throat> be able in the panel, I'm sure, to have one minute at the end. Minute at the end. Um, Please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lena. And I'm going to turn to people here. Um, I'm going to take, have to take questions all together, I think, for the next five minutes or so, and then invite members of the panel to, to come back. I'm going to throw my, my own first one in, which is to, to everyone, really. Um, in an ideal world, would you tighten the cap? Recognising, you know, and, and then I suppose the, the supplementary to that is, is it possible to tighten the cap, recognising the political realities of uh, resistance from governments to that idea? Right, okay, hands up. Uh, Mark Johnson over there. Yep. Lena, Chris, thank you. Mark Johnston from the WWF European Policy Office. Um, Jos, uh, thank you. Um, very specifically, um, the concept of a set aside in the 8th March communication from your department um, so far remains a vague concept. 
Um, could you confirm, please, if there is a legal base uh, for action on this? And if so, what that legal base is? Thank you very much. Axel Eggert, Eurofair European Steel Manufacturers. Um, Mr. Kumar, I'm not sure whether you were serious about 200 billion of windfall profits ArcelorMittal. That is more than the annual turnover of the whole European steel industry. So um, on this uh, also, um, we are not making any profits. Of course, some of our companies had to sell allowances due to the crisis, but they will have to buy allowances back in the third period. Our experts say that, of course, we have a certain amount of unused allowances which can be carried over to the next period and they will be uh, um, taken uh, up until 2014. So we have uh, still a serious amount of allowances to buy on the market in the next period. Uh, secondly, on uh, Mr. Scorecroft, of course, increasing the power price is maybe something for your sector, but not for energy intensive industries. Uh, the European steel industry has energy costs of uh, 20 to 40 percent of the whole production costs. So reducing energy consumption is a core business for the European steel industry and other energy intensive industries. We do not need any further incentive. We do not need a higher target or a higher carbon price for that. What we need is breakthrough technologies and we hope that uh, the Commission and the Member States and the European Parliament can support this. Uh, third, a question from Mr. Um, Joost Elbeek. Uh, the benchmarks, you said uh, the benchmark will not be changed. But effectively, we will be hit uh, anyway because the cross-sectoral correction factor will probably be changed from 1.74 to a higher uh, number. Or can you maybe confirm that this will not be true for manufacturing industry? Um, maybe I leave it with these points. Thank you very much. Jesse Scott from Demos Europa. The usual two themes have come to the fore, that in order to decarbonize, we need to bring forward key technologies and that there are concerns from economic sectors about costs. In light of that, it strikes me there may be a fourth option for how you could use some set-aside permits in the ETS cap. Uh, Jos mentioned earlier the NER 300 fund and how useful that has been. That consists of monetized permits. Would this be an option for what you would do with a set-aside to turn those permits into a fund which was dedicated at accelerating key technologies or at supporting low-carbon transition for some key sectors, perhaps in some of the more vulnerable countries? Um, dare I say, since we're in Brussels, that this would also be potentially a way of keeping some of the cash value of the ETS here in Europe not just in the member states through the revenues, not just in industry through some of the windfalls. Eivind Hoff from uh, the Bologna Foundation. Uh, Jostel Becker, you said something interesting. You would like to see CCS mandator mandatorily applied from 2025. You didn't specify uh, to what applications you would like to see it mandatorily applied. Uh, but you emphasized uh, the role of the ETS, and uh, as we see it, uh, using only this ETS to drive uh, things like CCS may, may risk uh, us leading into the dead alley of unabated gas. So we may get, um, it may, an increasing um, EUA price may effectively kill uh, unabated coal, that would be helpful, but if it leads us into the dead alley of, alley of uh, unabated uh, gas, it doesn't help us much uh, towards the full decarbonization. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, I think that's the two more. OK. Rémi Gruen from the uh, European Wind Energy Association. Um, I had a question to you, Chris, um, because as the figure released by the Commission show on the, on the ETS, there is a, a split in ETS between uh, the combustion uh, installations and uh, industrial installations, whereas um, the power sector mainly basically um, emits more than it's being given free allowances at the moment, and that's been the case for 2007, 8, and 9, uh, sorry, 8, 9, and 10. And the, because of the crisis, industry sectors like the, like the steel sector have less emissions because of less output than they have allowances. So basically we face a situation where the power sector, is, for them it's cheaper to buy allowances on the market than change the way they produce electricity. 
and the industrial sector does not need to change its way they produce steel because they are overallocated because of the crisis. So we still have a price of carbon, so it means consumers are still paying for a price of carbon. Do you think from your perspective as, a, as an elected uh, representative, uh, at some point when this gets out, it might lead to problems towards the ETS from, from the public? Because basically we are paying for something that is not delivering change in the way we produce, even though it is delivering, or the crisis rather, is delivering some kind of emission reduction. I think I might dodge that one myself, but as we have such expertise on the panel. Uh, and the final hand up there. Thank you. Uh, hi, it's Jane uh, Morkoff from Palapsa News Agency. Um, a question for Joss Delby Cat. I just wanted a, a kind of firm line answer on what the EC is going to do if it thinks that carbon prices are too low to stimulate investment in the third phase. Um, and um, on that, I can just add in a comment myself. What do you think about you about uh, national floor prices, Jos? And, um, oh, and, and finally, on, my, on the CCS, as that's been raised, and I'm a former rapporteur on, the, on this, uh, the low carb, as, as John said, um, Euroelectric is working on the basis of CCS being commercially available from 2025. The low carbon roadmap says 2035. How come we've slipped 10 years? Overnight. Chris, Goodbye. we had a sensitivity of 2035. We to put all eggs in one basket. Okay. Um, I, I know there's another hand up, but uh, we're only going to get 10 minutes for... Okay, very quickly. Come. Marta Ballesteros from Client Earth. Um, um, I'm interested in the set aside. And uh, my question is, um, if, you, if we take into account that there is the limitation of the linear factor uh, annual reduction uh, in the ETS directive. The, um, it is the only possibility for, uh, um, as uh, Sanjeev was mentioning, the only possibility or one of the possibilities, one of the options would be to cancel the allowances within the trading period. However, for that, there is a need for legislation because you need to change some of the uh, wording of the ETS directive. On the other hand, if the decision would be taken, if, if in your in the communi commission communication in May 2010 and the last one this year, you're talking about uh, 1.6 billion, million, billion uh, uh, as at the 1.4, sorry, to reduce to be that need to be reduced to take into account uh, the result of the other policies and also the oversupply of allowances. Um, why the Commission wouldn't take the option to act before 2013 instead of waiting until there is eventually a legislative process which an uncertainty on the final result? Well, yes, you're the senior policy maker here when it comes down to it, and I'm afraid most of those questions inevitably fall on you before, uh, before the others get a chance to comment. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I will need a bit of good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, on the set aside, I mean, it's the same question or a similar question. What is the legal base? Uh, I, I think that um, um, if we would go uh, for cancellation of any allowances, I think then we would have to change the ETS directive. So we would need a modification of the directive. I think that's a, a, a fair point. Um, but uh, setting aside is not cancellation. Setting aside the sparking allowances, and um, we are still investigating. But uh, uh, we are not. There are different opinions, like always. Uh, we do not think that for a setting aside, we have to go through a review of the directive, um, because we are not keen to open up the ETS directive uh, in the short term. There may be issues that have to be addressed in the medium term. We will, uh, we will have to wait and see, but at least we have to start uh, implementing the, uh, the third period. It would create a lot of uncertainty, and if you open up for one element, you open up for more elements. So uh, that's, that's uh, the, the issue on the table, and we have been making very clear that uh, when it comes to uncertainty to the market, we do not want to create uncertainty to the market. Uh, that's why I think uh, setting aside ideas have to be clarified before 2013. Uh, so as to uh, uh, give a, uh, an alert in time to market operators about, um, uh, about future developments. 
So that, that's, um, that's where we are on the setting aside. Uh, you mentioned the 1.4 uh, million allowances. There are many figures around. Uh, you may look into the uh, um, impact assessment we have been uh, doing. Uh, you know, these are all models. Uh, one on the higher end is the 1.4. There are other estimates that are lower. Um, so that, that's the, the, the zone within which we are discussing and, and thinking of a possible setting aside. Um, the question of the benchmark. Um, I would, and I intended to be very clear on that, that when it comes to allocation for free, any discussion on the set aside would not interfere with the decision on the benchmarks. So what we agreed on the benchmarks is a benchmark on the basis of which a number of allowances are going to be given for free. And when it comes to the setting aside, we made the link to the auctioning part of the allowances, not to the free allowances. I think what industry has not yet seen, that is that if they get um, uh, what they will get under the benchmarks, and if there would be a set aside, there will be a, a positive price effect. And so what they get for free is going to have a higher value. I think industry is not yet uh, thinking that through. Uh, well, you are, you, are, you are not in agreement, but if the, if the value of the thing you get for free is having a higher value on the market, so what you get for free is more worth than before. I mean, th that's a very logical uh, deduction I would make. Uh, there may be other effects, uh, but, th but that is what I uh, would like to, uh, to put forward. Um, the idea of extending the NER 300 um, uh, is, is an, an interesting option, um, but it's not in the ETS as it stands now. Um, so we have now carved out the allowances for free in three sorts, the auctioned, the allowances for free, and the new entrance reserve. And that's where we are at this uh, point in time. The setting aside is uh, uh, somewhere hanging in between. But if we would uh, have the, ex, uh, the idea or the concept of the NER 300 uh, prolonged, it should be through an ETS directive change. We cannot do it inside. I think the, uh, I stand to be corrected, but I, I think that uh, uh, knowing also the, the political debate we had uh, in preparing for all this, and also the, uh, as you were rightly mentioning, the subsidiarity uh, element, it would be a complicated debate, but I cannot see it uh, taking place outside the review of the ETS, which is not on our table, uh, I would like to underline. Um, uh, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting option also for the future. I, uh, when I uh, heard the reference to the set plan, uh, the set plan is a nice plan, but yeah. it has not uh, uh, been funded. So <laughs> someone should uh, make the wake up call uh, somewhere. Um, on my, my quote on the mandatorily uh, obligation on CCS, I did not make that comment in a policy context. It was the modeling tools that we did in the impact assessment have different uh, dates of, uh, we, because you have to make uh, an, uh, um, um, an explicit assumption if you want to calculate your roadmap figures through from which moment on. Fuel, fossil fuels will be linked to uh, CCS, and that is the point I was making. Uh, we have a variation uh, between 2025 and 2035, but it's in a, in a, in, in a uh, modeling context that I was making the, the comment, not in a policy context, because I mean that's part of the energy uh, uh, performance standards that Sanjeev was making, and that is uh, uh, another issue. Um, but um, uh, so I would like to correct there what I said on CCS was in, uh, in, 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 in the, uh, with, uh, against the background of the modeling. Um, what to do uh, in terms of investments if the carbon price would be too low? That's a very uh, tricky question. Um, uh, what is too low and what is too high? I mean, we have no definition of what is too low and what is too high. I think that we will have to judge a little bit when the dust has come down on energy markets, because there are three key elements happening on the energy markets today. The one on post-Fukushima was mentioned, and on the nuclear, uh, the future of nuclear, 
the jury is out. And I don't know. I cannot say yes, I cannot say no. What I expect is that we may have nuclear continued, but with fewer installations and later compared to what was in the cards. How much later and how much fewer, I don't know. But, uh, you know, nuclear is under pressure, as you can see. And, um, and the decision of Germany yesterday, I think, is a very important one. The decision by Switzerland is an important one. So I, I think the dust has not come down yet on the nuclear debate. Uh, the second element is that in the Middle East, we have an, an Arab uh, spring in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Middle East is very important in terms of delivery of oil and gas to all of us. Uh, there also the dust has not yet gone down. Uh, it may go to the better, what we all hope, uh, but that is not yet uh, really uh, uh, assured. And the third element that we see is the uh, shale gas development in the United States. Um, we may find shale gas in Europe, but apart from that, uh, you know, shale gas development is not going to take place overnight, but the prices of natural gas has gone down significantly. And gas imports in Europe are increasing because of the United States becoming rapidly uh, self-sufficient and even exporting natural gas. So the price of gas has gone down historically. So uh, what is the future of that? I don't know. But I think on, on, on energy markets, those three elements uh, will have an impact on the carbon price. And we saw the first impact on the carbon price when the first uh, decision was made by Mrs. Merkel uh, to put the 17 installations on hold. Um, we saw that the carbon price was reacting with three, two, three euros increase. Uh, we have also to wait for uh, the impact on that, but that's the beauty, I would say, of the, of the carbon market. The cap has been set. You can have a cap that is set in legal terms, delivered through CCS, delivered through renewables, delivered through nuclear, and the market will make a number of decisions that are going to have an impact on the, on the carbon price. Um, so the fact that the carbon price have been reacting clearly to the nuclear decision so far, I think is, is, is an, another demonstration that the carbon price is working. Um, the last question on the floor prices uh, in, in the UK. Um, given what I just said, the cap is set. So I wonder what a floor price um, set in one member state is going to have to the overall cap. It won't have any change. It may have a change in the UK, but if there is less emissions in the UK, there will be more emissions elsewhere because the cap is set at the EU le level. So the uh, debate on national floor prices is, in my view, not belonging to the climate change context, but is more related to what kind of technology one wants to push. Uh, nuclear is very, uh, very important element in this uh, respect and it is more linked up to industrial policy than to climate policy as such, because the cap is set in legal terms for the 27 uh, member states. So that's what we made known to the uh, UK authorities. Um, that there may be good or uh, bad arguments on the national floor price. It's not for me to pronounce on that, but when it comes to the delivery of the cap, it won't have a clear impact because as uh, much is reduced in emissions in the UK. Somewhere else, inside the same cap, emissions are, are going to increase. Thank you. Uh, my question, which was, um, if you had the chance, would you tighten the cap? Uh, I mean, you could also comment a bit, you know, maybe, maybe that's simply politically unrealistic. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you know you can't get into that fight. Well, uh, you replied a question. <laughs> I think in an ideal world, uh, in an ideal world, there's certainly a world in which, you know, we haven't discussed much the international environment, but uh, it, it's not very helpful that uh, Mr. Obama has been dropping his greenhouse gas uh, law, uh, climate change law, entirely. I mean, let's face up to that. Um, um, so that is a suboptimal uh, world uh, we are in. And, of course, the economic uh, crisis is not helping us either. So. Uh, I, I think if uh, we would be able to make abstraction of those two, a better international negotiation context and a better economic context, I, I think we would have better political arguments to go for a tighter cap. But uh, in the absence of that, we have a rather complicated uh, political debate. 
You didn't say it, but I think that hints that you would tighten the cap if you could get your way. But anyway, okay. Um, now, look, we're, we're past 11 o'clock, so I'm just going to have to give the other speakers, you know, sort of a one-minute signal, really, to reply to everything you wish to, or to have a final, final word. Oh. Sanjeev, there was a specific question addressed to you. So. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, just, just let me quickly wrap up the industry perspectives. Um, most of the energy-intensive industries that are on the carbon leakage list will be able to qualify for state aid guidelines to compensate for the increase uh, uh, price uh, of CO2 um, from their electricity consumption. So that element is already sorted out. What that does mean is, is it puts pressure on member states to actually find the money to pay for that compensation, and that's where the ETS auction revenue comes in. I just want to come back to your question, Chris, about is there a political will? Actually, I think there's a huge political will. Um, you have governments that are about to get windfall bonanzas in terms of new money coming into their um, uh, coffers. Everybody has counted for that three or four times in each and every budget. To the, the prospect of wiping out those billions of euros is a huge, huge driver. You've already had some very brave member states come out at government level, environment ministers come out. But as, the, as we get closer and closer to undermining the commercial value of ETS <coughs> auctioning, I would expect more member states to come out backing some intervention to correct the, the ETS. Thank you, Chris. I'll, I'll try and I'll, I think I was only asked one question. Uh, I didn't actually say electricity prices were going to go up um, in my presentation. They have in the past. I think they will in the future. Um, so uh, that, that's part of um, moving to a low carbon economy. Um, the th one thought struck me actually is that um, ETS is meant to be a market based system, but we spent all morning about how we can pervert the market and get everybody's favourite um, bit of technology in place. So uh, do we believe in markets or don't we? Um, your electric does, I think. Um, Sanchev asked, um, what do we want in, in your electric? Uh, be quite clear. We would like to have a target for 2030. Um, as I've said, what we have on the ground now is not likely to change much before 2020. So any tightening of the 2020 target merely means that we have to deliver with what we have. And picking up Joss's point about waiting to see what happens on nuclear, any, um, any thought that we may have about set aside or a 2020 target, we will have to see what the impact of removing nuclear or an amount of nuclear from the market will have. If all 30-year-old nuclear plants are removed from the market, our calculations are some 800 million extra tonnes of CO2 will have to be emitted to offset the fact there is no nuclear. So that is somewhere at the top end of the set aside. So be careful what you wish for. Um, <clears throat> Sanjeev, a reserve, a reserve price has another, another name in my book, and that's called a tax. And I can't see the difference between the two. Um, the other issue um, you raised about the 1.74 per cent, it's going to have to change. If we're going to meet the targets in 2050, the 1.74 per cent will have to change. I think the argue is when. Um, and a point that Giles made, if, if 40 euros is what his estimate is, will have to be the price uh, of carbon to um, incentivise commercial CCS to be deployed. Um, if it was 40 euros tomorrow, could I come to you and start building a CCS plant? Or would I have to wait until it's commercially available? Because quite simply, when CCS becomes commercially available, it will be the price setter, but it has to be there first. And I think a lot of the argument about support is to do with how do you get things to the market? Um, and the other thing about your 20 billion euros that's going to come in in auctioning revenue, I suppose governments could set it off, off against the 71 billions there paying in renewable support. John, yes, we will build you a CCS plant by 2015. Even if the carbon price is not 40 years and there's sufficient public funding in place, we will do that with full guarantees on price and delivery date. And planning permission? Uh, we will work on that, yes. Chris, um, is it politically feasible, uh, the set aside and to tighten the cap? We think it might be. The big piece of politics that has changed here in the last two years is a growing realisation on the part of finance ministries across Europe of the advantages to them in terms of the auction revenues of having a higher carbon price. And the politics is changing now, especially in the new member states. 
Jesse Scott's point about future additional NER 300s, we think that's an extremely interesting idea, one that we would support. Uh, Joss, we hope that it can be looked at. You say it's uh, for the future. Maybe it's something that member states could address on a voluntary basis. Ivan Hoff's point about gas. Let me give you one statistic. By 2035, on current trends, 56% of all power sector emissions in Europe will come from gas plants. That's an IEA figure. There is no way we're going to decarbonize power in Europe, therefore, if we do not apply CCS both to gas and to coal. Finally, Joss, note your three points, the three things you want to wait for for energy markets to calm down, extremely valid points. Our experience, and I suspect, John, you would concur with this, is that in practice, energy markets never calm down. Thank you. <laughs>